our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. Welcome to Unspun, the podcast that makes you better at finding the truth. The way people get news is changing. It used to be that there were many reporters who would research stories and write articles, but now politicians and famous people share information directly with you on social media and the internet. That means you find out things fast, but it's up to you to make sure the information's actually accurate. And newsmakers don't always do their part. The temptation to manipulate information is strong. They bend the truth to deceive so that they can avoid accountability, so that they can advance their agendas. When you recognize these agendas, you can sometimes find out what's real. And we're at a crossroads where anyone can share anything online. So it's important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Finding that deception before it goes viral is pretty much a survival skill now. And we're going to do it together. Let's get unspun. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Unspun. I'm trying something new this week. We're going to try having just me for some mini episodes. My idea behind this is that I don't always have a guest for every other week, but I do have a lot of things about media literacy in the news that I'd love to be able to share with you. So we'll have some short in-between episodes. They'll be about half the length of the other interview ones. I'd love your feedback on it if you have time to pop over to the review setting on whatever podcast app you're using and just uh, leave me a note if you like these kind of episodes, if you don't like them, if you prefer the guests. But I'd love to hear from you about this idea. So it's just me. And instead of a warm up, let's review this week. I've got a couple of clips that illustrate an idea from an earlier show. So what is the problem with the things these people are saying? First up, I've got two folks who have different perspectives, but actually have the same sort of logical issue. Have a listen. St. Fatty had an interview with Fox News yesterday, and apparently he's still stewing about a joke I made about him at the Oscars. What is up with you and Jimmy Kimmel? Because during the Academy Awards you posted, has there ever been a worse host than Jimmy Kimmel at the Oscars? Less than an average person trying too hard. And he then read that on the air and then took a crack at you. You getting even with and him what else all? did I say? I said some other pretty good things. What well, were you getting even with you him had for all? If you had Slavidopoulos. So in this clip, TV host Jimmy Kimmel is having an insult trade with former President Trump. The clip is from Kimmel's show, and he's actually showing a clip from a Fox News interview where Trump wants to make sure that the Fox News interviewer knows that he called George Papadopoulos slopadop. So what's the issue? Well, it's our old friend, the personal attack. The thing I would point out in this, though, is that both of them did it. Uh, Kimmel was more polished when he called Trump St. Fatty. It was on St. Patrick's Day or the day after St. Patrick's Day, I guess, when this aired. Um, but, you know, he and Trump both kind of did the same thing. They tried to sort of diminish somebody by saying something mean about them. Let's listen to another example. I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> this actually comes from the Democratic debate heading toward the 2020 primaries. And so that's actually Elizabeth Warren, who is talking about former New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg. It was his first time qualifying for a debate, and Warren is using a personal attack to make sure that his ideas are discredited before he even gets to share them by attacking some things that he's done before. So that can be our review. And let's move on to our topic for this week, where people are getting influenced online. The Pew Trusts do a whole bunch of research studies, and one of the things that they do is that they study social media use. And so they just released a new one in January. And it was really interesting to me to see that a lot of the familiar networks actually have gone down in popularity. One is down particularly much, and that is Twitter, which uh, when it became X, apparently it lost a whole bunch of its relevance in people's daily lives. Anyway, it's easy for us to get upset about what people post that you see on some of those big networks, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your TikToks, those kind of things. But a less obvious place of influence is messaging apps. And so that's what I want to talk about today, a particular messaging app called WhatsApp. I want to talk about that because its influence is showing up in some really important places, in particular with health information and with election misinformation. And this is not just a U.S. problem. It's really even more of a global problem. So what is WhatsApp anyway? If you haven't been studying abroad or had a student study abroad and you're in North America, you may not even know. 
But WhatsApp is deeply popular in other countries, particularly in the global south, so in Africa and in South America. And WhatsApp is also very popular with expats. So often people who have migrated, say, from Central America to North America, we use WhatsApp to keep up with their family back home. It's also quite popular uh, in Asia and India in particular. And the thing about WhatsApp is that it supports group messages. So you will find messages shared between families. You'll have these large extended families who have these WhatsApp groups where they, you know, keep up with each other and then they share important messages. And you'll also find affinity groups, you know, so clubs, people with interest in particular things, those kind of things. The fact that it supports those group messages is where we get into trouble because the um, kind of things that get shared on a messaging app, they're not always easy to see. So when somebody posts something on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, um, most often people can see those messages, uh, or at least the employees of those companies can see those messages. But on WhatsApp and on other encrypted messaging apps, it's closed. It's a closed system, and even the employees cannot see what's happening. And so that is really great for your privacy, but it is really bad for the spread of misinformation. The other thing that's a problem is that WhatsApp is super popular, and it's popular because it's free, right? So most people globally do have access to phones. However, in a lot of places around the world, full access to the internet is very, very expensive compared to what people earn, right? It can actually even be, you know, unaffordable in a lot of places. So WhatsApp, those kind of services are really tempting to people who don't have a lot of money but do want to stay in touch with other people in their lives. They're able to get those information pieces, but they are not able to fact check them because they don't always have enough access to uh, networks and data to do that. So because you've got this system where you have a large number of users, they don't have a lot of access to other information, right? They're kind of information poor and it's encrypted so nobody can see what you're doing. You can find that people who want to be bad actors, they can cause a lot of mischief. So for example, uh, Washington Post did a bunch of interviews around issues in India, and an Indian political party told Post reporters about how they're coming up with posts aimed at exploiting fears of people who are Hindu in India. So in India, there's a lot of religious intergroup tension, in particular between Hindus and Muslims. And in fact, a Post article reported they had 150,000 social media workers who were just propagating these fear-mongering posts across this really giant network of WhatsApp groups. Most people who are in WhatsApp groups are in more than one of them. So even though the platforms have tried to restrict the size of the groups, if you can be in five of them, you can still spread the messages really fast. And they actually had this one story that was kind of concerning, right? It was about some men who had stopped to give out sweets to children. And apparently that's a common thing to do. When you go traveling, you carry some you know, chocolates or candies with you that you can share with children that you run into. And so they stopped and they did that, and they actually got attacked by local villagers who had seen fake videos that were spread on WhatsApp about child kidnappers. And some of the men actually got away, and the villagers sent video of them to a WhatsApp group in a village that was kind of further down the road. And people from that village actually put up a roadblock to stop the car. And a mob of hundreds of people dragged those men from the car and started beating them, and they killed one. These men were not kidnapping children. The child kidnapping um, fears are largely just stoked by media and not really even true. But in the first half of 2018, there were more than two dozen people in India who died because of incidents that were connected to these kind of WhatsApp rumors. In Mexico, right before a Mexican election, there was this WhatsApp video that circulated and it was this really grainy footage and it was showing this guy being burned alive in one of the Mexican states. And the people in the crowd in this video were shouting Morena, which is the political organization of the guy who eventually won the election, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who won the election. And they were shouting that kind of in the background, and they were implying that this guy was being tortured and burned to death for his political beliefs. You know, also not true. It was a video of something completely different. The crowd wasn't saying those words, all of those things. This kind of misinformation doesn't really work unless you have people to spread it. And John Oliver actually did a really nice episode of his Last Week Tonight show that I'm going to link in the show notes for you. 
But uh, he had this one little section in there. I want to just play a little clip of that. So these apps are a cheap and ubiquitous way to allow people to stay in touch with family and friends and also get news and share information in their home languages, which is obviously very appealing. Unfortunately, they're also a huge vector for misinformation. There is actually a saying in the Latino community, in the Venezuelan and Cuban communities, about la tía del WhatsApp. It's the aunt that goes on WhatsApp and receives uh, any type of conspiracy theory and forwards it to all her contacts. We all have somebody in our family like that. So the person talking in the video is talking about his tía del WhatsApp, right? My WhatsApp auntie, who is the one that everyone in the family knows is going to send you all of these crazy cures and, and those kind of things. So these abuses have been happening in a lot of places and there's a lot of concern about them. And so there's been some efforts to help, and there's been a fair amount of research on the role of WhatsApp in sharing misinformation. So, you know, as we said, India is facing issues with the violence that are fueled by false WhatsApp messages. Um, WhatsApp started really encouraging people to report those kind of messages. And they also did things like labeling messages that are forwarded as a way to hopefully slow misinformation. In Brazil, about 10% uh, of WhatsApp users lived in Brazil during their 2018 election. And there's a whole bunch of media accounts you can read about how these automated services, you know, you might call them a bot. They were posting tons of misinformation about uh, Bolsonaro, who eventually did win and become president, and against his opponent. And, you know, so a lot of people believe that this misinformation did actually change the election. Millions were spent on spreading it. And so there were some calls in Brazil for WhatsApp to take stronger action, maybe putting in those forwarding limits like they had in um, India. In Nigeria the next year, WhatsApp was used to spread fake information about the country's president actually having died, including fake photos. And political parties were hiring young people to spread these propaganda messages. And it was just false information. So why does it matter? Well, some research that they did in Malaysia showed that WhatsApp actually significantly influenced the way people decided to vote. So the misinformation, it worked if it was shared on WhatsApp. And if you think about it, it makes sense that that would be the case because you're getting stuff that has what we call social proof with it. So it actually has, you know, something that's sent by someone you know and care about. And you're probably going to trust that more than you are information from just like a neutral person that you don't know who they are. It also has kind of a nuanced impact on political participation. Um, these WhatsApp discussions that people have, they can positively impact activism. They can encourage people to get out and protest, do those kinds of things. It can affect political participation, but that seems to be linked, the research is found, to age. So um, discussing on WhatsApp in some ages encourages people to vote and in some ages it discourages people from voting. The uh, company has tried to share some things to make it better. Uh, so they've done the things like identifying forwarding information. And they've also sometimes tried to limit the number of times a message can be forwarded to try to do that. But the conclusion of sort of policymakers and researchers all over the world is that this really is not super effective. It does help to reinforce, you know, collective identity and social movements, so helping people to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. I uh, wrote a book called We Are Alt Gov that was talking about the development of that kind of social movement, and, you know, those online tools can be effective for that. And you can also see those political movements using it as an organizing tool. But it also negatively affects your political knowledge, so the more people use it, the less they know about facts. And it's associated with participating in illegal protests. All right, so it's a really complex kind of thing that you have, but it has some really important impacts. In addition to the impacts on the political cycle, there has been a ton of fake news around health that gets spread on WhatsApp. So people, you know, particularly during COVID, we saw a lot of this. People were concerned about um, safety, right, and what was the best thing for them to do. And you saw a lot of anti-vax propaganda getting spread and really being targeted. You'd have people in the United States getting information from their relatives in El Salvador who were saying, oh, well, you know, this doctor in El Salvador says the vaccine is harmful or masks are harmful or something like that. Or you would just see things where people were just sharing fake cures. You know, it's kind of like the um, hydroxychloroquine all over again, but with other different kinds of things like boiling a bunch of citrus peels and different herbs together and inhaling the steam from that. And that was going to fix what was wrong with you and keep you from getting COVID. You know, just bad information that encourages people to do unhelpful things and not do the right things. So we still have a research gap in understanding some of these dynamics, in part because it is very hard to research because it's a closed system, but it is an important one. And it is one that is continuing to show impact 
really all over the world, including in um, North American elections that are coming up this year. So what is the takeaway for that? If you have a Tia de WhatsApp or if you are seeing people who are getting information in these private and encrypted groups, I would still say use the three-part test, right? So this is where you're asking them some questions to encourage them to think through the things that they've heard. So asking, you know, where did you hear this, right? And so they might say, well, you know, I heard it in this WhatsApp group, whatever. Okay, and is that a good source? How do you know that's a good source? Another question you could ask is, you know, the person who shared it with you or the person who's showing up in the video, do you know that they exist? Would they be the kind of person who would have that information? That's part two. And then part three would be the why did you hear this? Why did this person send this information to you? Why did they want you to know it? And it might be something like, well, you know, they're concerned about me. It's a member of my family and they're sharing this with me because they're concerned about me being healthy or they're concerned about uh, the best government in my country or something like that. That's great, but they might, their concern might be clouding the things that they're sending to you. They might be sending things because it makes them feel in a particular way, right? And so by asking these questions, where did you hear it? Would that person know it? Why did you hear it? You can sometimes encourage people to think through their decisions to re-forward information. Thanks a lot for joining me on Unspun this week and on my special trial mini episode. Again, I would love to know what you think about it. If you have a minute to go to whatever feedback mechanism is on the podcast service you're listening to me on, I would love to hear about that. And uh, next week, I'll be back with another guest. So thanks a lot. See you next week. Thanks for getting Unspun with me this week. Unspun is a production of me, Amanda Sturgill, and is a proud member of the MSW Media family of podcasts. Send me your thoughts and ideas about trickery in the news on Gmail at theunspunpodcast at gmail.com. I even write back. And find this episode's show notes and more information at theunspunpodcast.substack.com. Want to learn more and get smarter? Check out my book, Detecting Deception, Tools to Fight Fake News, which is available on Amazon or your favorite online bookseller. And until next time, stay sharp, everyone.